So today we're going to be talking about the exposure triangle, something that's super fundamental in just the fundamentals of cinematography in general for, for cinematography and for photography. I think if you understand and you don't have to master it, but at least to understand these fun, this, this exposure triangle and the three, comp three main components, you, you can't go wrong with exposure. You just can't. So yeah, let's just get right to it. So the exposure triangle is made up of three main components, ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. As you can see in this triangle right now, if these just sound like numbers to you and you don't know what you're meaning, like Albert, I have no idea what you're talking about. Do not worry. That is why I'm here. <laughs> We're going to go through these together. So first component of the exposure triangle is aperture. The aperture refers to the specific setting of your lens's iris. So I'm sure you've met, you may have heard this if you're a beginner, and if you were not a beginner, feel free to skip this section. But if not, um, feel free to also watch it. It's always good to recap things. Like if this is good for me. When I was building this course, you know, I, I really enjoyed relearning things and sort of getting back to when I was in film school, not even film school, before film school, when I had learned all these things. The aperture refers to the specific setting of your lens's iris. I'm sure you may have heard, we have to think of our lens like the human eye, like the iris of the human eye to be specific. Aperture is measured by f-stop, so in that scale that you saw, in that first, that triangle, that diagram, which is also down here, is measured by f-stop, which is the actually the ratio between focal length of the lens and the actual diameter of the opening of the iris. In my opinion, you don't really have to, you don't have to know this. In my experience, is not super important, as long as you understand how it works, how the aperture works. Do not, you don't have to understand how the formula works, but aperture is very important. For example, f 2.8 means, so that's, as you can see on the far left of the scale, it means you have a wide aperture, or f 12, meaning you have a small aperture, as you can see in this diagram. It may be confusing at first, don't get me wrong. When I first learned about aperture, I was very confused. And as I look back at it now, it's kind of funny just because it's, it's quite simple. But just remember, the smaller the number, the wider the aperture, hence more light. So if you have an aperture of 2.8, just think about your, your, your aperture, your iris is open the widest possible and usually letting in as much light as possible. If you're at f12, it's really small and you basically are letting less amount of light. Many cinematographers and photographers believe that the aperture will have the greatest impact on the overall aesthetic of your work. I truly believe this. Before coming into every project, I already have an aperture in mind of what I want to shoot in just because, you know, I already had a point where I really understand aperture and, you know, it's not like I'm playing around with what aperture I want to shoot with. Obviously, that's not always the case because you have to work with, with what you have. It really depends on the setting you're in. And sometimes you have to play around with these things, which is why we're learning about the exposure triangle, because it's all about changing certain things and getting to your exact aesthetic look. Because when you change one thing, you have to change the other. So this is why we're getting back in sort of the basics of the exposure triangle. So once again, at the bottom of the screen, you can see from f f2.8, being the widest aperture, so letting the most amount of light. So as you can see, I see the scales getting brighter as, as the numbers go lower, as the, as the aperture gets wider, simple. All right, like I said already, the iris is a mechanical multi-blade device and we'll be, we'll go be going through this in, in a future lesson and when we talk about prime lenses, but it's the, it's the multi-blade device inside a camera that controls the amount of light that is allowed through the camera sensor behind it. It's like I said, it's very similar to the way the human eye works. The iris can open to allow more light to enter the lens. Likewise, it can also restrict the amount of light. Now you might be wondering, oh, it's a simple answer to everything. Oh, if it's too dark, I'm just gonna open up my, my aperture to get the widest aperture to let, let in the most amount of light. However, that is not true because the aperture of a lens also affects the depth of field. An expression you've probably heard of before and which we'll get into right now. So the depth of field, I love the depth of field. This is something that I've been, you know, super interested in for a long time, even when I was in middle school, high school, because this is a term I learned at a pretty early age, but it's something that really can define your work and can make you kind of go from intermediate or beginner to professional, really understanding iris, aperture, and then depth of field, really, because the depth of field in reality it can, it can distinguish something to making, making it look more professional because of like the blurriness in the background. 
So this term refers to the plane of focus that you will have to work within your shot. Or in simpler terms, how much blur is in the background. So as you can see, the background that I have right now, kind of blurry. So you can, you can immediately come to a judgment that, okay, he has an aperture that's quite wide. He's letting in a lot of light. Like I said, a wider aperture, so a lower f-stop, provides a more shallow depth of field, creating soft backgrounds like what I have right now that really separate and draw the attention to your subject. A smaller aperture creates a greater depth of field, allowing more of a scene to be brought into the field of focus. This is more ideal for landscape shots. So basically, shots you want to have everything in focus. So ideally, you want to be shooting at like an aperture of 5.6 .6 to maybe 4, f11, f8, to get everything in, everything in focus. And this is super important to, un to understand. Because the aperture setting has such a huge impact on the look of the image, you usually want to set the depth of field at the beginning of the shoot. This is something I mentioned earlier. This is something that I still practice with. Like before coming into shoot, I already know the aperture that I want to shoot with because it's super important. There may be situations where you can't have an aperture in your head and you, you just can't work with it. For example, you're, you're going to be shooting outside all day and there's so much light but and you can't shoot at the full, at a 2.8 uh, at a wide aperture because you're letting in so much light and everything's exposed is too wide and you don't have ND filters for example which we will get into later if you don't know what ND filter is and you don't have ND filters basically act as as sunglasses for your lenses or for your camera and so ideally you're just going to turn down your aperture to let in less light or you switch in other things, ISO and your shutter speed, which we'll get into later. So don't worry about that too much right now, but that's an example. A good practice to have is before every shoot, photography and videography, have an aperture in mind because then you'll, you'll play around with your shutter speed and your ISO and you know, regarding of your, your aperture. As you can see to sum things up, smaller f-stop number, more light and larger f-stop number, less light. So we have an f-stop of 2.8, which creates a more brighter image and a shallower depth of field. And then we have f12 on the other side of the scale, having a darker image and deep depth of field. So here are a few examples that I have of stills and some photos that I have taken in, in my past work. So this is a still of a film I shot, a documentary I shot in, in, in Haiti. And so you can see this is a really, really, shallow depth of field there's really 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 focus on the subject and I, I really wanted to focus on this because this is the opening shot of the film i really wanted to focus on this man and isolate him so i was like okay i'm gonna shoot an f2 f 2.8 but you're being like oh my god how the hell is he doing this and not having a white screen because there's too much light you know you're you're being like oh my god he's in haiti there's too much light as you can see i had an nd filter which we'll get get into later to get shots like this outside at 2.8, you need an F ND filter. All right, so another one, F2.8 music video that I shot with my really good friend Max. It's a really great effect when you want to isolate the subject. As you can see, like this subject, you know, him standing in this, in this dead center of downtown crossing in Boston, really want to isolate him. I mean, the music video was about him being sort of a, a creep, being lonely, and, you know, him standing in the middle of downtown crossing at you know with this aperture it, it just worked the aesthetic was too perfect and i have another shot of it like yeah so another another angle just works great works really great and just so you know all of this is done with natural light which we'll get to in other lessons working with natural light if you don't have the studio lighting and you can't work with that and how to adjust according to what you have the sun which is amazing Here's another example of a photo, a photo shoot I did uh, of this clothing company. Shot 2.8, really wanted to isolate him. And then you could really see the, the, really the effect it has like from him in the woods. And I actually shot it uh, at an angle where the sun was right behind him. So it created this sort of halo effect around him. So it really, really isolated him and really like separated him. Not only having a, a wide aperture, which separated him from the background, but having this halo from the, the sun. The sun rays coming right from behind him really separates it. As you can see, like on the outline, basically this is what we call a halo effect because this light, this outline around the subject, it's really great. Something we will get to later, some, some more tips I have for you when shooting, but right now we're in the basics. So bear with me. We're going to get through this course together. <laughs> F 
5.6. Like I said, you really want to bump up or sort of have your aperture a little bit more closed when you're shooting landscape shots because you want to get everything focused. And for this case, I was shooting at a sunflower field in the south of France and I needed to get everything in focus. So hence, I shot at 5.6 with no entity filter because I didn't need it because it was actually quite early in the morning. So there was not too much sun sunlight, but beautiful image. Everything's in focus. Yeah, almost looks like a painting because everything's just, there's no, there is no depth. So it just feels very flat. And this is what I loved. And this is the, this is the sort of the intention I had to keep it flat, no depth, kind of make it look like a painting. And I love it. We're into the next component of the exposure triangle, which is shutter speed. So what does shutter speed do? Shutter speed simply controls the speed of how quickly the shutter will open and close for each exposure. This is also very important in photography. You know, my course is obviously is more towards filmmaking, but I do dabble a lot into photography because this is not only a course for filmmakers, this is also a course for digital creators. So filmmakers and photographers, super important. I believe that photography and, and, and cinematography, they overlap so much. Obviously, if you're coming from cinematography and you're going to photography, it, it's much easier because it's quite, it's quite literally a still of your, of your moving image. Obviously, if you're going from photography to video, videography, it's a little bit different. In my opinion, in my at least in my experience, I, I work in both cinematography and photography. I have professional jobs in photography and professional jobs and in cinematography. So it's very important to learn all of this. We mainly see this number expressed as a fraction of a second, something like one of sixtieth of a second or one fiftieth of a second. This actually comes from the photography world, like I mentioned, as it refers to the physical opening and closing of the mechanical shutter controlling the amount of light to strike the film or sensor before processing the image. You know, as a term, photography is light writing. Simply photo, light, graphy, writing. Simple. In the cinema world, we actually traditionally use the number represented as a degree, so 180 degrees, which we will get into later, but in my opinion, not so important. As long as you understand shutter speed, because we'll be working with DSLR sort of mirrorless cameras. So the 180 degree expression in cinema world is really not so important because we are working with smaller cameras. So more versatile, not, not saying that they're not professional, but they're more accessible because you're not going to be work, working with this big, you know, big, uh, airy camera or this red camera. If you have one, fantastic. So how does your shutter speed affect the video? A fast shutter speed, something like one, one over 250 or five, or in other words, 45 degrees results in each frame having a sharper detail, but also more jumpy movement. So this may be ideal when you're shooting extreme sports, dancing, or something in slow motion. We'll be talking about frames, of sec frames per second, which really correlates with shutter speed. A slow shutter speed, something like one over 24 or 360 degrees, results into a very smooth and fluid movement. But this also turns to blur details, unless both camera and the subject remain perfectly still. For example, a lot of night photography is shot with a long exposure, so the camera shutter is open for a very long time, letting the most amount of light in to reach the sensor of the camera. Yeah, shutter speed is so important. It's really, really important. Like I said, these three main components of exposure triangle, they all affect each other, and you have to understand, you have to know each aspect to really manipulate your camera, to manipulate your image at the end of the day. Okay, to, to sum up shutter speed, the smaller number means more light, which means a slower shutter speed. A larger number means less light, which means a faster shutter speed. As you can see in this moving scale on the bottom, one of two, one over 250 means darker, darker image, but a faster shutter speed. And the other end of the scale, we have a half of a second, which is a brighter image, but a slower shutter speed. All right, moving on, ISO. ISO refers to your camera's sensitivity to light. ISO actually stands for International Organization for Standardization, or sometimes ASA, American Standards Association. You don't need to know what this stands for. Obviously, it's great if you do, but it's not important. Do not worry about that. Before the age of digital camera, ISO measured film stock sensitivity to light. So for example, a low ISO, which would be less sensitive to light than an ISO of 1000. This is very important when shooting film stock, both in cinematography and photography, because it can be quite expensive to buy film. This is specifically for 
shooting in film, in film stock. You know, you're going to be, you know that you're going to be shooting inside all day. You know, you have an ISO stock of 100, you know, not so sensitive to light. So a lot of your images are going to be really dark. And if you can't open up your aperture all the way or you can't, you can't change the shutter speed, not, not, not the most ideal. But if you're shooting outside a lower, a lower ISO of 100, it gives you more room to play around with your aperture and play around with your shutter speed just to get that aesthetic you want. So just to get you give you an idea. Typically, I want to stick at like an 800 ISO. That's like my, I don't want to go any, any higher than a thousand. And I don't mind, I can go all the way to 100, 200, 400, 800, but no more, no higher than a thousand for me. You typically, that's my rule of thumb. Because if you know, if you go to a higher ISO, you tend to have more grain or a sort of what we call it noise or grain of the image. So, and it's not very nice. Obviously, it, it could be a sort of an aesthetic that you want to have to have this grain and something you can add in post as well. But for me, I don't I don't like that, and many other cinematographers and photographers don't. So I tend to stick at a lower towards a lower scale of ISO. So for me, 800 is kind of like the sweet spot for me because it's not too it's not too sensitive and it's not too not sensitive. So <laughs> kind of like the perfect middle ground, in my opinion. So as you can see on the scale we have at the bottom, this moving scale from left to right, 100 being a low ISO, which is less sensitive to light in comparison to what we have on the other end of the scale, 6,400, a brighter image because it is more sensitive to light. So it's a higher ISO. Okay, to sum things up with ISO, higher number equals more sensitive to light. A lower number equals less sensitive to light. So as you can see, once again, in our scale, 100 being a low ISO, so typically you want to shoot at this ISO in daylight because there's lots of light and which will give you a really smooth and crisp image. And then if you want to go to 3,200, 6,400 ISO, this is typically at night when there's low light. But when you're shooting at a high ISO, uh, you will get more no noise and more grain. So once again, 100 being a low ISO, less sensitive to the light because you, need, you, you would like to shoot with this when you have lots of light. Like I said before, I typically stick around 800 ISO because you're not too you're not too sensitive and you're not too not sensitive. It's quite the perfect middle ground in my opinion. I do shoot at 400, I do shoot at 200, I do shoot at 100. I rarely shoot at 1600. Like it, it actually I never really shoot at 1600. It's just something I don't just because I know I will have a grainy image. So I try to avoid that. So ISO is like one of those other things that before coming into a shoot, you really want to have an idea, but obviously this is something you can change. Um, as long as you don't go over a certain ISO, in my opinion, a thousand, don't go over a thousand, you will get a grainy or noisy image. Okay, frame rate. You might be wondering why are we talking about frame rate and the triangle only has three sides? Well, frame rate is like kind of like the unofficial fourth, fourth side of a triangle. Obviously a triangle only has three sides. But a frame rate refers to the frequency rate at which consecutive images called frames appear on a display. This is expressed in frames per second. Something you have to always remember that as your frame rate increases, your shutter speed will have to follow along, which is why this is important. This is why I'm telling you this, because obviously it's not the officially part of the exposure triangle, but it is super important because when you change your frame rate, you have to change your shutter speed. Since each frame will be exposed for less time, it will result into a darker exposure. So you may not notice this at first, but it does make a di big difference. So let's look at the scale. You're shooting at 24 frames per second, which is a typical standard like cinema frame rate. It is the closest thing we see to the human eye, 24 frames per second. So if you're shooting at frame for 24 frames per second, you have to times that by two, double it. It's actually one over 48. However, most cameras don't have 148 uh, as a setting on the dial so you want to get as close to it possible so most cameras and dslrs mirrorless cameras as 1 over 50 so we shoot at 1 50th of a second we just change our shutter speed 1 50th a second when we're shooting at 24 frames per second all right moving on 60 frames per second so if you really want to play around with like slow motion that's when you start into getting the higher frame rate so 60 frames per rate uh 60 fps 100 fps this is when you're playing around with slow motion shots and you're really manipulating this in post-production. So 60 FPS, 120th of a second. So obviously, like I said before, 
the closest option the camera has is usually 125th of a second. So yeah, same goes for 120 frames per second, one over 250 of a second. Always, always remember when you increase your frame rate, also increase your shutter speed because the frame rate and shutter speed work cohesively. So please always remember that. So for interviews, I always want to shoot at 24 frames per second because that is the most natural looking frame rate. Like I said, it's the closest thing that we see in our, into our eyes. It's what most cinema is shot in, 24 frames per second. So interviews, 24 frames per, per second. So obviously for that, like I mentioned, 24 frames per second, I have to adjust my shutter speed to 150. So those two things, they, they, they are fixed. That is something that is fixed. I will adjust my aperture and my ISO according to this. So I came into the shoot already knowing that I have to shoot 24 frames per second, that I have to automatically double it. I also wanted to shoot at a really shallow depth of field. However, I knew because I was shooting at 24 frames per second, I may have to adjust my aperture. But thankfully, I was able to shoot at the aperture I desired, which is f2.8. And I did not need an ND filter because there was not that much light and it was great. And then for the ISO, I actually shot at ISO to 800. We were in the wine cellar, so there was not a lot of light. So shooting at a high, I had to shoot sort of, I had to bump up my ISO because uh, I needed to be more sensitive to light because I didn't have much light. And even if I had my aperture at 2.8, I still didn't, I still needed more light. So that is it for exposure triangle. If you have any questions, feel free to write me or ask me during our weekly Q and A's. And on that note, I will see you on the next video.